Coming up on Tech News Today, why Google Plus hates your name, tattoos that could be used for covert communication, stupid merger math from AT&T, and maybe an iPhone release date, or maybe not. You'll have to watch to find out. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Friday, August 12th, 2011. Tech News Today is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaktar. I'm Jason Howell. And joining us from CNET Senior Editor Eric Franklin. Welcome, Eric. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's good to have you along, man. Uh, Eric and I used to work together at CNET back in the day. You, you were the labs guy, but you've you've branched out, right? Uh, yeah, I'm still the labs guy officially, but um, I'm doing tablets now, which is I don't know if you guys have heard of these things. They're kind of popular these yeah, days. Kind of a big deal. Wait, tab. Yeah. I heard they're just a fad. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like hard to explain. It would take a scientist to explain They're it. Like so gel caps, right. gotcha. Well, it's the things yeah. with the styluses, and they run Microsoft OneNote. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, those oh, things. Yeah, yeah. Right. I know those things. Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. All right. Well, let's, let's start off with uh, some Facebook news. Uh, yesterday, we talked about the Google Plus Games Edition. Uh, and I can't remember if we mentioned it or not, but Facebook had announced a gaming-related uh, announcement that was going to happen in the evening. They made their announcement yesterday. And it is a new separate stream for game activity on Facebook. Uh, scores and achievements will be in a ticker that scrolls by while you're playing. Frequently played games can be added to your homepage bookmarks, uh, and you can select what friends see which games. This is a new thing for Facebook, giving you total control of what people see right from the start instead of waiting for the normal freakout period. We see the wall full of invites, so they're play this Mafia Wars game with me. You won't have to see that necessarily. Yeah. And the final feature is full screen expandability, so when you're playing your, your uh, Farmville, you can go full screen and fill up the entire thing. So more pixels are, are to my virtual farm. Yes, exactly. Brilliant. So the, the big thing here is the, the ticker, uh, which, you know, Google was kind of snotty in their announcement of Google Games saying, well, we're going to have a separate tab and all your gaming stuff's in there. So unlike other situations, you won't get spam. Uh, Facebook is, uh, is doing a similar thing, but in a different way. They're saying when you're playing a game is when you'll see achievements and scores and things that other people are doing. In, in the game that you're playing or in just random games in general? Whenever, when you're playing any game on Facebook, yes. a, a ticker will scroll by showing what other what your friends are playing. Okay. Whether it's whether or not it's the same game you're yeah, playing. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's the same game. Because, and I think that that, I know some people will be like, ah, that's so invasive. I don't care about the stupid Mafia Wars. I only like words with friends or whatever. But if you're playing games on Facebook, odds are you're going to care more about that social element of gaming in general. Also, if you're just like, you know, working on your Farmville uh, and you see that, you know, I don't know, Sarah's playing Pac-Man, you can actually click on the ticker and it'll take you into Pac-Man and then you can start playing against Sarah. Pac-Man's a horrible example of that. Let's say words with friends or something. Sure. I was, I was going to say, you just jump friends. right in, and yeah, all of a sudden yeah. it's like, ah, the ghost. <laughs> Tom is, <laughs> is, there, is, there is, to, is there any way to turn that off, though, so that you, 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 know, you can play by yourself and not have to worry about anyone else bothering you? You know, I don't know if you can turn the ticker off. That's a good question, because it hasn't rolled out into my Facebook account. You can control what other people see. You can say, don't show this game to anybody, uh, or you can say, show this game, but only to these friends. Don't show it to all my friends. Sure. And then, of course, any friend can go in and manually say, don't show me this stuff. Yeah. Right. right. Of, so of this, idea, this idea that you can have more control over your games and who sees it. I mean, Google Plus is doing this. The fact that Facebook is already open to everyone, 750 million, it's like half, well, three quarters of a billion people can access this like now. I mean, is it is it a good strategy for Facebook just to go, what's Google doing? Let's do that now. Let's well, do it again. This is interesting, right? Because yesterday they sent out their releases to the press around the same time in the afternoon. Google Plus made their announcement first mm -hmm. on the blog. Uh, but I think they got wind of each other's thing and were in sort of a race to get their stuff out. 
that's the thing. But Google Plus is still closed. So, like, I mean, the fact that Facebook might look, to some of us, it looks. I've seen some other posts. Like, Facebook's just copying Google Plus. But the thing is, Facebook is accessible to everyone right well, yeah, now. There's no way Facebook could copy Google Plus in this because Google Plus came out with it the same day. Same and, day. And, yeah, I mean, it's all unless, unless they they're did spying. Even one if day. even if there was a 24-hour period between the two uh, announcements. Uh, big companies like Facebook don't work that way. Yeah, and they're not going to change an entire strategy to keep up with Google Plus within a day. Absolutely, and it's not it's not directly copied. It's no, a, it's a, you know, Google Plus is not doing a ticker that scrolls by while you're playing the games. It, it, there's a different implementation here. Yeah, and it's not I the only difference between the two social networks. I know people love to compare the two, but they act differently in many ways. Eric, don't you think they just both reacted to the fact that nobody likes being spammed with Mafia Wars announcements? Uh, you know, you guys don't like being spammed with Mafia Wars announcements. I, that's that's the only reason I'm jo I joined Facebook in the first place, <laughs> was so that my sister could you know, spam me <laughs> as much as she wanted right. about Mafia Wars or Farmville, whatever. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't, I don't. You know, for for me, it's like I, I don't. I'm not a, I'm not a casual social game type person, and um, so it's it's hard for me to really, like, it's hard for me to really uh, figure out like. What's the appeal of these types of games? But I guess they're free. They're really easy to get into and hop right out. But I, I, I don't get like why people keep coming back to them. I don't know how fulfilling they are, and that's 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 my dilemma for these types of games. And I don't yeah. understand the, the appeal. Well, so, some of it is just that reward center stimulation of like, ooh, you you know, you made strawberries. But some of it is is the like someone is relying on you to play this game, and that that draws you in as well. And so both these situations where you're seeing what friends are doing and you get a little of that competition going on with achievements and stuff draws people in as well. One thing sure. we didn't mention yesterday when we talked about the Google Plus uh, gaming is the developer cut. Developers are going to get 95% of what they charge for games on Google Plus. That, that's far and away above all the other uh, splits. Facebook does the normal 30%. They take 30%. They give the developer 70%. That's what Apple does. That's kind of the normal thing. It's usually 30, 70. So for a limited time anyway, I guess to encourage developers to get interested in Google+, Plus, they're like, yeah, you get to keep almost everything. And yeah, then when Google+, Plus uh, launches games, I think it had like 16 different games. And this is a great way to get a lot more developers on there because the, there's going to be a gold rush. It's going to be very easy to find stuff in the beginning mm -hmm. because there's only like what a handful of games. So these games will become very popular. Plus they'll get 95% of the, of the uh, revenue. So that's, this is a good time to be a developer for Google Plus games. I think they also uh, are sort of forced to do something like this to get people interested at all because developers are busy. I mean, you know, they've, they're, they're already developing for Facebook, for example, and it's like, yeah, it's 70%. Okay, I, I guess it could be a better ratio but it isn't. But for Google+, Plus, they've got a lot of interest, but they need people to have the incentive to spend a lot of time on the Google+, Plus platform. So good on them. I, I, I hope that they, they get what they're looking for. Games or no games, not everybody's pleased with the real name policies of either Facebook uh, or Google+. Plus. Google had said, we're going to change the policy. We're going to give you notification uh, when you have a problem with your identity. And so Google's Saurabh Sharma announced the first significant change in their name enforcement policy. It's a four-day grace period from the time you are noticed of a violation and suspension uh, to the time when they actually suspend your profile. Now, this at a time when there is a rising tide of anger about the real names policy. And, and uh, Tim Carmody at Wired has an excellent post up kind of detailing what the objections are from people like Microsoft social media researcher Dana Boyd, uh, EFF's Jillian York, uh, there's the, the Atlantic's uh, Alexis, Alexis Madrigal. You know, these, these folks are among many voices out there saying, look, this isn't just, oh, I don't want to have to give my real name. Like, these are dangerous policies. It hurts disadvantaged communities. It hurts, uh, it hurts dissidents. Uh, and it's destructive to society. How is that? How do they explain? How are they justifying that? Like dangerous to society by wanting to use. Wait, let me get it straight. You're saying it's dangerous to society by wanting or by kind of wanting people to use their real names or. Like well, I mean, this is just one example. Uh, we talked about this a little bit on the social hour earlier this week. Is let's say somebody um, had been, you know, a, a victim of like a stalking attack, or okay. for, for whatever reason, they've got a real name. You know, it's not it's not a secret, but they want to be out there online, and they don't want the wrong people to be harassing them. Right. So right. that's you know, it just gives you one example of somebody who might have a really good reason to want to use a pseudonym.
Right. Uh, Dana Boyd uh, notes that users of alternative names online are overwhelmingly likely to be members of disempowered groups. Teens and people of color still frequently use nicknames or handles on Facebook without anyone noticing. And so Google Plus is, is being prejudiced in this. I, I don't think Google is actively being prejudiced against people, but I think w what they're doing is sort of a Me Too situation, and they really don't know how to handle it. They said, you know, real names policy is what Facebook does. A lot of people at Google feel like having a real names policy means people will behave better because they don't get to hide behind a anonymity, and so we should just do it. And, the, you know, they keep hiding behind the fact that it's a field test, but it is a field test. And so they're trying to figure out, like, what's the best way for this to work? So one of the things Google wanted to do was they wanted to establish identity. Like, that's one of the reasons that Facebook was so popular for, like, it's one of the first things you do is, is that person really Tom Merritt? You check it out on Facebook, this person is real. And for Google, they wanted the same kind of thing. That's why they wanted the real name policy for a lot of this stuff. If they're going to be a legitimate social network, you want to be able to identify a person and they want to be the source of that thing. But it has all these unintended consequences where it is hurting people who are victims and, and things like that. But the thing is, again, Google is, they keep hiding behind the field tests, but they are willing to change the policies. I think this one, four days of notice, which is a lot of time in internet time. If you're on Google Plus, you kind of, you should probably be with the, the whole tech field right now. It's still skewing very tech based. But uh, I would imagine if people don't like this either, they're going to change it again. Well, and the again. thing, the, the, it, this is sort of a non announcement. I mean, they had already said we're going to give people a grace period where you can, you can look at your, whatever name you're using, if it's not your real name, and say, okay, I, I've, I'll, I'll uh, go ahead and comply with your, your policies. They just didn't say how long people would have. Now people have four days. Yeah, four days is, for, in many cases, plenty of time. I don't know, unless you're on vacation or something. I mean, I don't see this squelching any of the anger that people have towards Google no, it, it, because they I, haven't actually done anything. It's given people a handle to post again right. about it is what it's done. Now, now Google engineer Joseph Smarr, uh, as, as cited by New World Notes and Read Write Web, uh, is trying to explain what's going on. He says, look, it's not enough to offer the ability to post under pseudonym, pseudonymous identifiers. If you're going to make the comment, commitment that we're not going to out your real identity, that actually takes a lot of work, especially if you're using your real account to log in and then posting under a pseudonym. And so we feel a real responsibility that if we're going to make the claim to people it's safe, you're not going to get outed, that we really think through the architecture end to end and make sure that there aren't any loopholes or gotchas where all of a sudden you get outed and that's a hard thing to do in software. We don't want to do it wrong. So they're not a, they're not opposed to it. They're not like doesn't sound I mean, that they're, way. They're, yeah, they're, yeah, they're just they're just saying like, look, it's it'll take a lot of work if we it re, if we really want to do this the right way. It'll take a lot of work so that we don't get you know a bunch of complaints from you guys saying that we didn't do it uh, we didn't do it thoroughly or whatever. I remember like it kind of reminds me of that Blizzard thing that happened a couple of years ago with the real name uh, forum. That's right. Uh, thing. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. When they were you know. When Blizzard was saying, hey, we're going to have your real names on the forums now. When you post, people will know exactly who you are. And people were just like, look, I don't want my boss knowing how much I post on the Warcraft forums. So that's not going to happen. And Blizzard, you know, backed off from that. Yeah. Um, I don't South know. Korea has actually backed off of their requirement that people use real names to register for an Internet connection. Mm. So a lot of people are realizing that, you know, this isn't a silver bullet for things. All right, uh, let's, say, let's uh, move on to our temporary tattoos that replace electrodes. <laughs> okay. Again? Let's yeah. move on to that. Again with this. This is new research published in the, uh, in the journal Science. Electrical measurements for things like EKGs and EEGs uh, can now be made using ultra-thin polymers with embedded circuit elements. The devices connect to the skin without adhesives. They actually use the van der Waal force so that it, it, the, the uh, normal attraction of molecules keeps them on your skin. Uh, and they're water-soluble polyvinyl alcohol sheets, meaning they work like a temporary tattoo. You paste it on, you dissolve the sheet, and then you have the electrode on your skin. Uh, they, they can do solar charging and possibly inductive charging. Uh, and they have been able to test it, continuously capturing data for six hours. And the devices can be worn for a full 24 hours without any degradation or skin irritation. So you've got this temporary... Tattoo is kind of a... I mean, it's more of like this... Almost like a little pattern on top of your skin that well, looks it's, Yeah, it's like a, like a Cracker Jack tattoo. Yeah. yeah, it's not really in your skin. <laughs> yes, thank goodness. Yeah. For that. You know, but you're like, I'm fine. I really don't need this anymore. So you've got this. You're, I, I guess, um, you can go, go wherever you want, really, because it can be transmitted through radio frequencies back to whoever needs that information. Yeah. 
I love it. I would think the idea is if, if you're going to monitor like uh, heart activity and things like that, you're not locked down to a you know, a giant machine with electrodes and then you can, you're free to do what you want to do. If you, if, you know, you don't have to be locked in this position. If you think of MRIs are a good example of this. When they were all closed, people were really freaked out about that. But once they opened up into the room, people were like, okay, I'll, I'll be able to stand that way. It's a great way to get a lot of data on people without uh, freaking them out any more than they have to be. Well, it's also, it's, a, it's the very logical evolution of medicine. I mean, we now have doctors who will take emails from patients and be able to answer questions. So you don't have to go into the office to just talk to a doctor for five minutes kind of a thing and pay your copay. This was also, it, you, you won't be required to go into a hospital to get an EEG when you can just wear this cool thing right. that all your friends will like that can be uh, uh, um, sending back information to your surgeon. And human machine interface uh, so we, we actually talked about this on triangulation this week uh, with Dr. Miguel Nicolelis, who's working on the ability to control computers with your mind. Uh, and one of the problems they have is that the best connection is when they implant the electrodes in your brain rather than having them attached on the outside. Uh -huh. This could help with that. Absolutely. Uh, and um, they suggest in this Ars Technica article covert communications. I was thinking more about the, uh, the other commercial applications, like if for focus groups. So you're watching a movie trailer and your heart starts racing. They can just test it while you're sitting there. This little tattoo, you got a little discount, so you can actually be a focus group without having to do anything. What would the covert communications be besides, you've got a heart murmur? Well, no, <laughs> or you're, maybe, yeah, maybe you're, you're in the back row with like a date or something. You're not even watching the trailer and you know, you're doing something else and your heart, you know, your, heart, your heart rate is rising for another reason. They don't even know. And they kick you out of the theater? That's how people... Oh, that's no, the, the usher too. So you think you're just excited, but actually you're having a heart attack? <laughs> wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute. And thank goodness you have the temporary tattoo. The covert <laughs> communications is like, you know, you could just mouth words without speaking them, and then the thing picks it up and transmits it. That's, okay. that's what I'm All guessing, right. something you're, like that. Yeah, a little bit more. The next. Or you could control your heartbeat as Morse code. That would be insane. I just think they look cool. Because they actually have tried this with these tattoos. They've put them on your throat uh, and, and then transmitted to a MATLAB program, which was able to get 90% accuracy on what you're, what you're saying when you talk. Oh, because for, of the vibration? Yeah. I've seen, I've seen some of the things for bone conduction, but this would be a lot easier to apply. Yeah, exactly. New Bluetooth headsets. Yeah. We're going to see a lot more neck tats. <laughs> like, the, does the design dictate? Tom like, needs to know what, what I'm saying of, right now. Uh, <laughs> Does the design dictate what, like, what type of communication uh, or how capable that that tattoo is? Because they look like those things from Blade. Remember how Blade used to um, he used to be able to identify vampires versus familiars by looking at the tattoos in the back of their necks. Right. Am I going too far with this? All right. I know, but I think there's a there's a whole market, you know, for for designer tattoos right there or tattoos sure. around. Yeah. Tattoos. Sure. Mm -hmm. And you'll know if your friend's a vampire or a familiar. That, and that's just a side benefit that you can't <laughs> underestimate. Bonus. <laughs> All right, let's take a quick break and uh, thank our sponsor, Netflix. Netflix.com slash twit provides you 30 days free. You could be watching Dead Like Me, Weeds, Roswell, all this stuff on your tablet, on your phone, on a bunch of Android phones, on the Wii, the PS3, the Xbox 360, uh, on, built into a bunch of televisions with a Roku, with an Apple TV. There's tons of ways to watch Netflix, even on, a, on your actual television. And you can get unlimited amounts of movies and television shows streaming to those devices right now. So don't wait. Don't, don't stop listening to the podcast. But go and sign up to Netflix.com at Netflix.com slash twit. And when you do, you have helped us to afford to tell you about Chrome 14. Chrome 14 already? Yeah. Didn't they just come out with Chrome 13? Yeah, well, they, they, it's, it's a fast... Rev process with Chrome, right? So they, they're constantly coming out with new versions. That's their deal. It's like you don't have to download the new version. They're not getting caught up in version numbers. They're just cranking them out all the time. So what's interesting about uh, Chrome 14 beta uh, is that it is actually uh, implementing C a native client for C++. So C++ would allow you to do a lot more advanced kinds of applications that HTML5 or Flash couldn't do. Is that what this, the whole point of this well, forget, is? Yeah, forget Flash. It's a, a, HTML5 and JavaScript is what, what most people are trying to do their web apps in uh, these days. That's the hot newness. But it can't, it can't do everything that you can do in C++. So the example they give in the WebMonkey article uh, is an online video editor. So you've got a web app that wants to do video editing. You could handle that in JavaScript. JavaScript's getting faster, but it's not ideal. If you were able to actually execute C++, you could 
offload the hard part of the video processing to C++ and then just have an HTML5 interface for people to do the editing. The first thing I think about when I hear, when I saw this news was this is for Chrome OS long term. This is a much longer term thing for, for Google because uh, if you want to access everything through a browser, uh, the current web technologies aren't there. It's not like C++ where you can actually do some serious, serious applications. And so in the long run, maybe one day you'll be able to do Actually, not even that long term, right? Maybe a couple of weeks. You could take a Chromebook where you're like, what can I do with this? I can't install programs. You'll just go and use a C++ thing that you don't even have to install, which I thought was kind of an interesting idea in the long run. I don't know about the short term and how they're going to get developers on their side. Well, developers are going to be on their side because they already program in C++. The, the downside is it's only going to work in Chrome. I mean, they have created an API. They call it Pepper, which allows the browser to talk to native client uh, and any browser could, in theory, implement it, but nobody else has. So, Well, that's not really Chrome's problem, though. I mean, they're saying, here, we're giving developers this really cool tool, so Safari could do the same if they wanted to, and so on and so forth. And Google may not care. They, they may like, you know what, if Firefox and Internet Explorer implement it, great. What we want it for is Chrome OS. Exactly. Because I could, I could see that being where the biggest advantage comes. And right. Google in the past has offered incentives to do new things, like there was all these prizes for Android apps. So maybe they'd be like, look, we're going to incentivize this. You can try this out, and we'll be giving you a way to get early into the market. Erica, do, do you have a, uh, any, yeah, any thoughts I mean, on what could be what this could be best used for? Sure, sure. I, mean, I just read an article in Edge uh, with Trip Hawk, Trip, uh, interviewed at, in Edge with uh, Trip Hawkins. Uh, he was talking about how he felt like uh, eventually all games, you know, people would play all their games through the web. And like this seems to be like, you know, one of the first steps in getting to that point. And, you know, go, going back to the whole Facebook games thing and Google Plus games thing, you know, like I said, like those games don't appeal to me. But if developers were able to take advantage of the hardware, uh, you know, get closer to the metal, take more advantage of the hardware, and make actual, like, and I, I know this sounds really elitist, but quote-unquote real games, like games that I would, hardcore games that I would be into, um, yeah, maybe I would play more, you know, Facebook games if they were actually taking advantage of my system. Yeah, it's one thing to be able to do Angry Birds in HTML5, but you're, you're going to have a harder time doing really cool first-person shooters. Uncharted 3 or yeah, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Does this open the door at all to like more malware if you can do much more powerful things than, than just doing JavaScript and, and, and uh, other weird takeovers on, on a web page? I mean, now you have access, a lot more access to the actual hooks of the, the operating system, don't you? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. You, you also have a security issue. You have to remember that uh, Google has said uh, they're going to maintain security. They're going to sandbox this stuff. But uh, I was looking on Slashbot, Slashdot, and a lot of folks were worried, you know, uh, that C++ doesn't have the right kinds of, of boundaries and, and, and memory uh, security procedures that a lot of these web languages have because they've been hardened over time. Right. It's about, I mean, Google's going to have to work on the security aspect of this unless you want more malware through a web page, which, or which is running C++. I, I just think it could be, <laughs> this could be gamed easily. Let's talk about AT&T. A law firm working on the AT&T T-Mobile uh, deal accidentally posted a partially redacted document to the FCC's website. Uh, before it got taken down, of course, lots of people got to look at it. The letter pegs the cost of bringing AT&T's LTE coverage from 80% to 97% at $3.8 billion. And you may think, like, okay, well, what does that matter? Here's the thing. AT&T has been going around telling everyone... We have to buy, be allowed to buy T-Mobile because there's 55 million rural users who will not get LTE coverage. We really want to have 97% coverage, but we need T-Mobile Spectrum to do it. They are going to pay $39 billion for T-Mobile, which begs the question, if it's only going to cost them $3.8 billion to get from 80% to 97%, why do they need to spend $39 billion to buy T-Mobile? Because they want to be the biggest... Uh, network in the U.S. Right, but that's and they want to stamp like, out their competition. He's like, no, no, shush, that's that, not the answer. But I love this because it clearly is, and that's what everybody thought anyway. And now it's like, how do you get out of this hole that you're in? Because yeah. now people know your financials. Now, wait, this document was meant for the FCC? Is that what the case is with this? This document, yeah, this document is being filed with the See, FCC. Now, that's what makes me curious about this. Now, it, in fact, the fact that it wasn't redacted, that that's one issue, but... If it was going to the FCC and it was from AT&T, 
I'm just wondering in context what exactly was going on in here because if they're presenting this argument to the FCC, that sounds crazy too. Like, why would they only say it only costs three point eight billion? Unless to do the this? redacted part was also redacted from the FCC. There could be part of it know. where they were saying, like, look, it would cost us this, but there are other reasons why we want T-Mobile. I think one of the things that AT and T has been saying, on top of the fact that, oh, it'll help bring you know other access to rural areas, which whatever, um, they were saying that. Competition is causing problems. So with having less companies will be better. That's one of their other crazy arguments. I'm not really sure yeah, why. Yeah, they've said that having fewer telcos mm -hmm. will actually lower prices. That was one of their arguments. So maybe they're trying to rely on that. But then again, there could be a whole lot more than just the $3.8 billion. I mean, if you think about it, T-Mobile shouldn't cost $3.8 billion. T-Mobile is a big deal. So if they're going to buy T-Mobile... It's got a bunch of goodwill. It has a big price. They don't have it. any really good arguments except for the like expanded coverage and lower prices. And so if you don't buy the lower See, prices, I, I want to read the rest of the, art, the the letter that's been redacted. Maybe there's other. Well, you got to read there. all of the documentation. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's why I'm like I'm thinking this. But but from from the people, I mean, I haven't read it all either. You're right. But from the people who have that mm -hmm. are covering this, they're like, this is really their 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 linchpin argument. But then, I mean, even if their cost to expand their network was less than $39 billion, which we know it is. They could do so many other great things for like, I don't know, $25 billion. They don't want to do that, clearly. I mean, we've no, seen this I, where I they don't what, invest in, yeah, in what, their own infrastructure. What people are suspecting and what they're calling this a smoking gun about is AT&T just wants to eliminate a competitor. And yeah, they get some spectrum. They'll be able to divest themselves. A Wall Street Journal reported that AT&T hired Merrill Lynch to advise him on getting rid of a bunch of customers in spectrum after the deal is done, which will net them $8 billion. So they can, they can, make, they can reduce that cost a little bit by doing that. Uh, but essentially, if they, they feel like if they do this, it keeps T-Mobile out of Sprint's hands, which mm -hmm. hobbles Sprint. It eliminates one competitor from the playing field entirely, gives them uh, more leverage, more spectrum. They're sitting pretty. I don't think it has anything to do with uh, coverage going from 80 to 97 percent. But that is one of the few reasons they have that is convincing mm -hmm. to regulators. I keep looking at this. I'm like, AT&T seems like the T-1000. I mean, you, it keeps, you busted up years ago. It's coming back together slowly, slowly, slowly. Yeah. So it'll the, be broken the, up. The, Wait till they buy there's Verizon. There's too much of a discrepancy between the two numbers, too. I mean, if it was 30 versus 39 billion, they might be able to fudge the numbers enough to still make the the case that this is really out of the goodness of the rural America, you know, that kind of thing. But no, th 3.8 billion versus 39 billion. There is no reason to spend $30 billion dollars unless it's to eliminate a competitor. Now, there's also some stronger. controversy about the timing of this. Uh, from this letter, you can see that they made the decision to not expand coverage to 97% in January, around the same time that they were making the decision to buy T-Mobile. So a lot of people point to that and say, aha, see, they, they, they made that decision on purpose so that it would look good when they made the argument about buying T-Mobile. That's a little flimsier. It, that's, that's very coincidental. Well, hopefully the government's taking, you know, taking a good look at this, and they're going to decide whether this merger is going to go through. Don't forget, it still hasn't gone through. AT&T wants to buy T-Mobile. They're still going through a review process, and now it was held up by that whole uh, Qualcomm acquisition, to the spectrum on Qualcomm that uh, AT&T was buying. Eric, do you think this is going to go through? And if it does, do you think it's good or bad? You mean the merger? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, you know, I, I have no idea if it's going to go through or not. I mean, I, I feel like if, uh, you know, a really, really large company like AT&T wants to do this, they will eventually find a way to do it. Um, I, if, I mean, if it's good or bad, if it improves their, their coverage, if it improves their network, then yeah, if I can actually get calls at work in my office, then I think it's a good thing for me at least. So if it actually improves their infrastructure and like, I don't know. Um, I think that's why a lot of state governors and, and other companies, the TIA, uh, Telecommunications Industry Association, came out in favor of the merger today. And that's an association that includes Sprint Nextel, along with Apple and Microsoft and, uh, and a lot of lo other electronics companies. I think, I think all those guys probably own um, iPhones or AT&T you know, phones and they just want better coverage. And yeah. I never thought Microsoft wouldn't be able to buy into it. A long time ago, they were going to buy into it for Quicken. And, that's, and, th and it, that merger wasn't allowed to happen. So maybe this will be one of those few times where the merger isn't allowed to happen because there seems to be a lot of evidence against the uh, about combining these two. I don't think I think this merger is definitely going to happen. I I, I think I don't think there's anything that can stop it. This this letter is is somewhat damning, but don't be such a pessimist. It's not. Well, who says it's pessimism? Maybe it's an awesome thing. Pot kettle black. Let's move on to the rumor <laughs> mill. All right, place your bets, ladies and gentlemen. 
I got the uh, the poker chips here. And, uh, how old are those poker chips, Tom? <laughs> They're from the 50s. And how long have you had those as props? We're just waiting to use <laughs> yeah. them. Yeah. Hey, Tom, can you explain me the, the laser eyes with the rumor mill? I know. Jason made that. Uh, it's got is lasers. That a, that a, what what needs to be Cyclops explained? Cyclops? It, it yeah. has lasers, and it's an ode to Tom's uh, desire to spell rumor with a U instead you mean of... to spell it properly. <laughs> yeah, oh, right. There uh, you go. Yeah. So here's the you story. You from Illinois. Uh, a, a, Jap a Japanese website called Koda Warasan reports that Apple's autumn event will happen on Wednesday, September 7th. Of the last four Apple autumn events, three fell on Wednesday in the first week of September. So they've got a good chance of being right just by guessing. And apparently, Koda Warasan has accurately reported Apple rumors in the past. So this may be right. They think it's going to be an announcement of the iPhone 5. Now, the Inquirer which has less of a stellar record on reported rumors, uh, says that, no, it will not be a new iPhone 5. It'll just be a cloud iPhone, and that the new iPhone and iPad won't come until March 2012. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't see... Okay, let's say September 7th is, is a real date. How what, much? what do you want How me to do with bet? these? <laughs> oh, are we actually throwing Make it rain, there? Sarah Lane. Because <laughs> <laughs> I love America, we're going to go red, white, and blue. There we There's go. three. Um, <laughs> I don't know how much money that is. A lot. Uh, let's say September 7th really is an announcement day. I don't think the cloud iPhone is big enough for them to have delayed anything up to this point with the with the with the frenzy that there is at least among you know iOS lovers about this I don't know I think that I think iPhone 5 and cloud iPhone if indeed there is a cloud iPhone and this is the first mm -hmm. I've heard of this uh, um, are both to be released they'll go hand in hand Eric Franklin where do you place um, your bet? yeah what uh, give me a uh, two white white chips over there All right. please. two white, All right. two white okay. chips yep. in the pot Eric's in yeah, I think I think part of me really wants it to be the iPhone five um, because I want an iPhone five as soon as possible. Um, but that's just you know the you know the excited uh, you know tech fan in me speaking. Um, but yeah, I mean I I don't know. It's I kind of agree with Sarah that you know it, it for for an event like this it, and and you know considering the the delay, they kind of have to come out with something big and a cloud iPhone is not that exciting to me. I as Actar, uh, I got place 10, your bet. I got ten red chips here. Oh ten. my goodness. One. I, you were so I will not it will not be on the seventh because Apple's seen this, it's gonna be the fourteenth now, just because they like to spite people. Two, mm -hmm. there will be two different iPhones. There will be the iCloud iPhone, which is kinda like the Apple T V, which they've already done. Apple's actually gotten people used to the idea of an unsubsidized phone just recently with the unlocked iPhone four. So I think this will be like $200, $300, so that'll be cheap. And there will be an iPhone 5 uh, that will be dual core and with a slightly slimmer build. So I'm saying all that's going to happen on the 14th. All right, I'm going to buy in for $20 Canadian. Oh. Okay. And, of course uh, you are. <laughs> <laughs> it will be September 7th. No use on this. For sure. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, and it will not be the iPhone 5. It'll be the iPhone 4S or something like that. It will be a new iPhone. It will be uh, probably have a lot of cloud features because it's iOS 5, and iOS 5 is all about cloud features. Uh, and we w and the announcement will focus on iOS 5 and less on the phone because. They actually just want to push iOS 5 and not the hardware this time and wait till next year to really, really like nail the hardware. So you're saying the 4S, if that's what it's actually going to be called, will, whatever, yeah. will be the cloud iPhone and we won't see the iPhone 5. Right. I, I'm saying iOS 5 is the cloud iPhone. So your current iPhone 4 will become a cloud well, iPhone. Well, then what's the 4S then if yeah. it has cloud features? Maybe it'll be the 4C. <laughs> or so the, just the faster four processor. Loud? Yeah, i4. I think it'll be. IPhone, I, I think it'll be similar to the iPhone 4 in specs and cheaper. I think it's going to be the iPhone Classic. Whoa! Whoa! Huh? Whoa! Retro. We'll Meta. find out soon enough. Blew my mind. mind blown. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the news fuse. <laughs> the Bay Area.
Area Rapid Transit District, a.k.a. BART, just prevented protests last night over a police shooting by shutting down wireless service. This is going to be of interest to people in the U.K. Activists had planned to protest the fatal shooting of Charles Blair Hill at four different BART stations. Uh, BART stated the activists had said they would use mobile devices to coordinate their disruptive activities and communicate about the location and number of BART police. So with cell service shut down in the stations, not outside, but in the stations, the protests never materialized. Now, we don't know if that's because they shut down the wireless service, but this bears on the controversy of what David Cameron said the other day. Okay, so I'm going to sound like I'm repeating myself, but we've got some potentially bad news for RIM. The Wall Street Journal is reporting that Sprint will not carry the WiMAX version of the playbook, saying the market is too crowded for another tablet. A Sprint spokesperson was quick to add that the move has no impact on our relationship with RIM. So, basically, if you want a super fast RIM playbook on the go, you might be better off getting the Wi-Fi version in a hotspot. But they're still friends. Yeah, they're, they're BFFs. Frenemies. Looks like all those QR codes and barcodes are catching on. According to Comscore, 14 million mobile users in the U.S. scanned one of those codes in, 20, in June 2011. That's 6.2% of all mobile users in the U.S. And they were likely to scan advertisements at home or in a store. QR codes are so popular that some people are even tattooing themselves with them. But Comscore didn't report on how many people are scanning people. Come on, Comscore, get with it. What about temporary QR code tattoos? That yeah. I'd like to see. I don't that know if that was in the report. Work as a pacemaker. <laughs> um, hey, Eric, are you are you wanting to buy Battlefield 3 when it comes out? Yeah, of course. I figured you might be. Looks uh, awesome. I have a pretty powerful PC, so, you know. I can, well, I here, can here's, the, here's the thing. This has got a lot of people uh, upset. Origin and Valve uh, having a squabble about how to buy the game. You can't buy Battlefield 3 on Steam. Uh, if you buy a retail copy of Battlefield 3, it is going to require you to use EA's Origin service so that you can access multiple EA services. So does this have you outraged, Eric, because you're going to have to install Origin to play the game? A lot of yes. people are upset. I'm shaking my fist as we speak. No, I, I, um, I just want to play the game. For me, it's like, yeah, that'd be great if I could play it, if I could download it on Steam and play it just uh, through Steam. And it kind of sucks that, you know, EA's kind of, you know, kind of get in the way of that. But I just want to play the game. At the end of the day, I just want to play the game and have the game work. As long as it works and it looks as great as it uh, looks and it plays great, I don't care. You don't care if they clutter up your so hard drive. So reasonable. What an, what an attitude. I, I like that. I, I really don't. I'll, I'll, I can race. I can delete that stuff after I'm done with the game. I, I don't know. I just that stuff doesn't get me going. Really, it really doesn't. Don't hate the EA. Play the game. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> a while back, we reported that the Amazon Kindle store was being inundated with spam books. What a drag! These books use cheaply licensed text with different titles sold to unsuspecting readers. They don't know. According to a marketing site called Warrior Forum, these spam books are now being removed from the Amazon Kindle store. Yay! Publishing these books are being told that their work diminishes the experience for customers. I'll say, spammers, bye bye go make your scratch somewhere else. Like the spam garbage can no, around the th corner. That, that app market is, is really big. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a new Android app called Six Axis will allow gamers to use a PlayStation controller to control games on their Android device. The app costs $1.66, kind of an odd uh, price there, and only works on some rooted phones. If you want to know if your phone's compatible, well, the app devs have released a Six Axis compatibility checker app for free. Now, using a controller with a phone might seem not so mobile, but if you connect your phone to your TV, it's a nice little mini console. Nice. I like that. Get ready for the wailing and the gnashing of game controllers. The game industry is in the toilet, folks. According to the MPD, industry-wide sales numbers, hardware, peripherals, and software only totaled up to $707.7 million in July. That's down 26% compared to the same month last year when the industry generated $961 million. And it's the lowest point since October 2006. The Xbox suffered the biggest drop in consoles, but it still was number one, outselling the PS3 and the Nintendo Wii. A tweet by Dan Neistead says that Compal and OEM will be shipping two, count them, two million Windows phone units to Nokia in September. That would get Nokia plenty of time to get its Windows phones out to the world by the end of this year. Nokia World is conveniently scheduled for October 26th through the 27th in London. So perhaps that'll be the big launch. We'll see. Nah, that's not going to happen. <laughs>
Up until recently, if you wanted to rent movies on your Android phone via Google Videos, you couldn't. An update to the Google Video app now allows users to rent movies from the Android market. The app is currently compatible with phones running Android 2.2 or 2.3. Oh, don't forget to get the latest version of the Android market app, too. So update all the things. That's always good advice. Let's move on to the randomizer. Randomizer. Uh, so, you know, the Girl Scouts are always out selling uh, stuff. Yeah, did you ever buy a box of trefoils? Trefoils? I, I actually don't, don't know that, what trefoils but... are. I always um, went with tagalongs. Do you, you ever get those, Eric, the trefoils? I don't. I have no idea what that is. No, what no. Is... You, I, us, nothing? No? You don't Smoas. buy those? You buy the smokes. You guys are missing out on fifteen billion dollars. Why? Wait, how? Uh, Tell me more. <laughs> researchers have figured out how to make graphene from a box of Girl Scout cookies. But only the tree foils. Well, they, I, I imagine they could make it out of tagalogs. I don't know. Uh, but they uh, a tagalogs, not the, the language. <laughs> not not tagalog. <laughs> Can't make it out of the language. language. It's a mistake I've made many Light. times myself. Uh, they uh, actually took a box of tree foils and. And we're able to make graphene, make $15 billion worth of graphene out of it. So clearly this is going to lead to a rash of muggings of Girl Scouts. Either by that really Scouts tech -savvy nerds or going. the price of graphene <laughs> is going to plummet. But you know, we need graphene because that's, that's kind of the next big thing in, in making uh, chips and, and Girl electronics. Good. Yeah. Wow. Let's move on to the calendar. $15 billion, you say? $15 billion. <laughs> Happy birthday, IBM 5150. On August 12th, 1981, you were the first machine to run a Microsoft operating system, the recently acquired PC-DOS, on an Intel processor, the 4.77 megahertz, no less. At a starting price of $1,565, you were cheap enough for people to actually want to buy it, and an industry was born. 4.77 megahertz, you say? Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful, huh? Mm. That's fancy. <laughs> the U.S. launch was delayed, and you cried and cried. But wipe those tears away, because the Acer Iconia Tab A100, wipe those tears, Tom. I'm wiping it's them. It's the first 7-inch uh, honeycomb tablet, if, you're, if your tablets are starting to confuse you. It's going on sale for $330 this weekend. That's for the 8-gigabyte price. The 16-gigabyte version will be $350 for $20 more. Do you think 30 more. years from now, the Acer Iconia Tab A100 will get a birthday party like the IBM 5150? Mm. I will be giving it one. All right. You better you believe it, here, it. Ladies and gentlemen. I'm still around. Throughout my will. Scotland's biggest video games festival has opened in Dundee. If you don't know what that is, it's quite pretty far north. And runs through the weekend. Thousands of people are expected to attend the event. The festival is organized by Aberte University. Hope I'm saying that right. And includes an international video game design competition. So by Sunday, three winning teams will be chosen. And then they become nominees for the 2011 BAFTA One to Watch Award. Very cool. The Samsung Galaxy Tab 10.1 European ban hearing will be held on August 25th. We'll be watching out for that. And the long-awaited Samsung Galaxy S2 US release date will be revealed on August 29th. It won't actually be launched. It will just be reveal the well, revealed they, they, what they the date is going they to be. They tried to play the Apple game. They sent an invite out and said, a special announcement, August 29th. And then they put a big Roman numeral 2 right. on it. We're like, oh, gee, I wonder what that's about. But it's like a press announcement about a press announcement is too many press announcements. Apple does it all the time. Well, at least yeah. it's not a press announcement okay. about a press announcement about a press announcement. That'd be crazy. That is Inception stuff, and I can't handle that. Exactly. So thank you, Samsung, for not upsetting me. <laughs> <laughs> On to the email. TNT at twit.tv is our email address. And Brian, a.k.a. Garst in the chat room, writes in and says, Howdy. I don't really recall you covering this, and given that the instructor, Professor Sebastian Thrun, wants to make his class the largest online class ever taught, you may want to promote it as well. He is offering his Introduction to AI course for free to anyone who wants to take it. I'm sure there are plenty of listeners that would be eager to take a free class from Stanford University. And if you read the page about the AI class, you'll find out that Stanford offers other engineering courses free of charge. You don't have to hunt for the link, though. I will provide it below. Uh, it is www.ai-class.com. Uh, and also check out csee.stanford.edu. Very That's cool. Awesome. Another email from Andrew in London. Uh, I disagree with this. Uh, he's talking about HTC's purchase of Beats. He says, don't worry, he's not driving as he writes this, so thanks for that. Thanks, thanks Andrew. Andrew. <laughs> I disagree that this is primarily about branding. I am not convinced Beats is a big enough brand. I think Jason had it right. HTC wants to focus on Apple's strong point. iTunes is a fantastic media system. 
<clears throat> hang on, he actually wrote that. But it has a huge drawback on the iPhone. Standard Apple he headphones are atrocious. With a decent emotional connection, good advertising hook, HTC can now push their handsets by advertising them as a complete musical experience. And also that differentiates them in a hugely crowded Android space. Just my two cents. I think Andrew makes a couple of good points here, uh, but I still think it's about branding on top of those points because it's not about Beats being branded, it's about Dre and Lady Gaga. They used her as well. And those are brands that people identify with. And when you diss Dre, brands. you diss yourself. There you go. So you're going to see a lot of <laughs> HTC phones in those videos now, aren't you? Thank you, Eric. I'm glad somebody got that. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, did I interrupt you? No, nothing pertinent. All right, we'll move on then to Kevin's email. He says, sorry if this is a couple days old. I've been fleshing out this idea. Facebook Messenger seems to be a good idea, albeit one that's been done a lot of times before. The problems come down to ease of use and native implementation. While I know it's far-fetched for all the device makers to band together, they never do stuff like that, would it be possible to create a text messaging standard that would be pre-installed on the mobile OSs, which would provide this functionality natively and wouldn't root through the cell carrier servers? So he's talking about uh, going around SMS, just using the data plan. I know Apple's creating their own messenger, which is the same idea, but of course, some of my friends aren't using iPhones, so that, that technology is a little short-sighted, a lot like FaceTime. I don't know. I mean, that's sort of what SMS is. Is It's well, the standard that all phones use already. Yeah, but it's, it's under siege by the carriers who want to charge yeah. you out the wazoo for it. Data only, cross-platform, cross-everything, email. There you go. No, but that's, instant messaging is different than email. No, but you can use email. They want instant up. messaging, not email. You need push email. So you're saying we don't need instant messengers and no one will that's ever not what use I said. them. No, that's what you're saying. No, that's, that's, that's the same argument. It's a way to go. I'm saying if you, there's not going to be a cross-platform thing that everyone's going to adopt. That's silly. Why wouldn't there be? Eric, do you think there, that we could ever have a cross-platform IM on phones, essentially? Yeah, that's I mean, what text messaging is. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I don't think there ever will be. I kind of agree with Ayaz on that. But, I, yeah, I mean, well, why not have one? You know, I, I think we're limiting ourselves in thinking that, you know, there's no way that can ever happen. But at the same time, there's no way that could ever happen. I, there is definitely a way it could happen. It's just... I mean, technically, sure. But. Nigh on impossible. I'll give you that. So you should release the application right now. You have it. You've made it, right? Just send I it just agreed with you. You can make it happen. <laughs> no, I can't. Yes, we should all make it you happen. You can make it happen. They can make it happen. Or huh? The audience can make it happen. We should open source this right now. We should and crowdsource do a Kickstarter it. project. There we go. We no, I think it's absolutely possible. It's just, it's just not likely. I mean, yeah. I am got close uh, with Jabber. But you just couldn't get AOL and Yahoo to jump on board. But eventually, we almost got, you know, with with uh, with clients like Adium and and Trillion, we almost got there. And I, I think uh, I think phones are crying out for it. People definitely want this. And email's not the answer. You can't be serious about that. You could set up push email. E email is uh, what not everybody, but many of us are trying to get away from. It's these old so standards. That's, that's not the answer. Are still persistent, and you can get them on almost every device. That's what I'm saying. Like if you wanted to try to do this, because it's not going to be easy to have a ton of penetration on every single device if you're just starting out. That's the thing I was thinking of because email is already around. Everyone's already got it, but you could probably tweak it. I probably would do it. That's what I do with my my Google Voice. I have it push an email. Google could do it maybe. I mean, to be honest, Facebook Messenger is as close as we've gotten so far to having everyone be on some sort of a standard because there's just so many people using Facebook. The, the problem is the carriers are going to do everything they can to throw a roadblock because they want to make money off text messages. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, good thought-provoking email, Kevin. Thanks for that. Uh, don't forget to check out the new Restoration Hardware iPad app. Uh, Restoration Hardware provides the furniture you see on the Twit sets, the, the desks we use on Tech News Today, uh, all of the chairs over on our living room set, the, the, uh, the stuff we use over on our round table set. Uh, and if you are in the, uh, the design in industry, or even if you just want some stuff for your home, uh, the, the uh, Restoration Hardware is unveiling its first ever iPad application, enabling clientele to browse its source books flag pages of interest, search for specific products, and make purchases with just the touch of a finger. Restoration Hardware app is now available free of charge at the iTunes App Store, so you can actually own the pieces of our set. Not the actual ones we're using, but stuff that looks exactly like it. Uh, and uh, vintage-inspired pieces that define Restoration Hardware. Uh, check it out. The Restoration Hardware app can also be used on the iPhone. We thank them for their support in, uh, in, in helping us with the decor of our set. Also, thanks to folks at technewstoday.reddit.com. 
We have uh, close to 2,000 people in there, 1,844 folks submitting stuff like CompFixer87, MacBytes, H.R. Himes, Captain Kipper, PC Guy 8088, and S.P. Sheridan, yes, who not is a not a dinosaur, named Sferodon. I got your email, and I will pronounce it right from now on. <laughs> uh, so thanks for submitting stories over there at technewstoday.reddit.com. Eric Franklin, great to have you on the show. Thanks again uh, for joining us. And let folks know sure. what you're doing over there in CNET and where they can find it. Uh, they can find CNET at CNET.com. They can find my reviews at CNET.com. I'm doing tablet reviews, monitor reviews. Uh, I do the Crave podcast every Tuesday at noon with Donald Bell. You can find that at CNET.com slash live. Oh, you're, right. you're doing the Crave. That's right. That's yeah. cool. You're carrying on the tradition. That's a lot of the kids are doing the Crave these days. Oh, everybody loving the Crave. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to learn about beer robots, Crave is awesome for that. Yes. Yes. That's... 50% of our material comes from that. I didn't mean that in an offensive way. I really do mean that. No, no, I, 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 I freaking love it. <laughs> you know, All right, I take folks. it as a compliment. Excellent. Uh, thanks again, Eric. And thanks for everyone for watching. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. If you want to get the show notes, we have a wiki link from there. You can also email us, TNT at twit.tv, or give us a call. Leave us a phone message. We may play it on the air if it's good. I challenge you to leave us a 30-second or less message that is awesome. Do it now. 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll see you next time.